If we look at the time period in which we live, we occupy this space in between the initial coming of Jesus Christ and his return. Now, some may argue, um, but I believe that we are much closer to the return of Christ than we are removed from his initial coming in the flesh. Now, most of us are familiar with the details of Jesus' birth. The Bible tells us that an angel appears to Mary and informs her that she will give birth to a son, and he will be the Son of God. An angel also appears to Joseph, confirming that everything that is taking place with Mary is indeed the work of God. At the time of Jesus' birth, there is this great rejoicing in heaven and earth. There are angels that are appearing, and there are prophetic words being delivered. A few months before an angel appeared to Mary, a man by the name of Zechariah and his wife were also to have a child, and the events surrounding the birth of their son, who would be named John, is pretty incredible as well. You see, Zechariah is of the priestly line, and he's serving in the temple, and as he's serving, an angel appears to him and says, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So those are the miraculous beginnings, the story of John the Baptist. And what I want to do quickly is to look at a passage in Luke 3 concerning John the Baptist. And this is what we find in Luke 3, beginning in verse 1. In the 15th year, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Skipping down to verse 15, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. There are a few things that I want to look at in this passage today, specifically three points. But I want to draw our attention to a piece of scripture that's found within this pa passage that I find very, very powerful. And it's this, that the word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness. We see, we already know that John the Baptist has this unique ministry. He even has a unique origin story as he is a miracle child of sorts. You see, John has a special call, but stepping into this call does not occur until the word of the Lord came to him. It is that initial word that launches John into this very visible ministry. Some believe that John was a part of a group known as the Essenes. And this group at times lived in the wilderness. They lived a communal life, meaning that they shared their possessions with one another. They also possessed a high view of scripture. They studied prophecy. And at times they lived in the wilderness and they aimed to live untainted from the world. 
So if John is a part of the Essene group, then it makes sense to see him calling people from an urban area into the wilderness, perhaps seeing this urbanized area as being tainted or compromised. And there's this invitation, a separation, so to speak, as he calls people into the wilderness. This is a place where they go and they repent. They turn from their old manner of life. They separate themselves and become consecrated. And that's the call that John makes. Repent. The Lord and his coming is near. So we go back to the word of the Lord that came to John. And that brings us to our first point. That John had a call upon his life. If you're watching this message today and you are a believer, then there is a call upon your life as well. Now, there are many ways to discuss this idea of being called. Countless books and articles and papers have been written to help people discern what their call is and how they can walk in their purposes. So there is extensive material, but today for our reasons, our, our purposes, I want to simplify our understanding of God's call. You see, a certain way to view God's call is to be invited into a relationship with Christ and to live a holy life. And what I mean by living a holy life is that we are called to live a life that is set apart from the ways of the world, that we live a life that is solely focused on pleasing God and being used by Him. You see, this is not a call for moral perfection, but a consecration, whereby Christians see themselves as instruments being used in the hands of God for a special and unique purpose. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the apostle is writing to a young church. And this is part of what he tells them as young believers. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. In this passage, Peter is quoting from the Old Testament book of Leviticus. And in Leviticus, God is instructing the nation of Israel that they are to live differently. He has given them specific regulations and guidelines and laws so that people in the surrounding nations will see their uniqueness and know that they belong to God or to Yahweh. You see, Israel is a chosen nation and he has special purposes and plans for them. And as they live out this life of consecration, everyone around them knows that group of people belongs to God. Much of the New Testament speaks to how we are to live as Christ followers. What's always important to know and something that I always stress is that the New Testament is not a how-to guide. It's not a guide that simply provides us teaching so that we can correct moral behavior. It's way beyond that. The Bible presents the Christian life as one who is in intimate relationship with the Father through the person of Jesus Christ. And as we know him, we understand our call to live holy, consecrated lives. And from that place, everything else flows. That is the place in which we live. And that is our call. So before we start to discuss topics related to the, our purpose and our call, and, and how we are to make life decisions. And we ask questions, God, where are you taking me? What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? Before we get into any of that, we have to acknowledge that we as God's people are to live a holy life, a life 
separated unto God. So going back to John, John has this unique call, but this unique call will not come into play until God's timing arrives. Remember, John is in the wilderness and the word of God comes to him. So John has this call upon his life and we have a call too. The second point I want to mention is that even though John has this incredible call, there is a period where John has to wait. In Luke's gospel, we've already read from chapter 1, but if we turn a page or two, we're actually fast-forwarding 30 years into John's life, where John is actually called to perform his work. The question is, what is happening during the course of those 30 years? The Bible doesn't give us specific details as to what is occurring over this time period. But what we can see from the small glimpses we get of John's life is that John isn't spending his life waiting without a purpose. If John is in a scene, then it makes sense that he, again, is in the wilderness. And even if he doesn't belong to this group, the image of him living or spending significant amount of time in the wilderness shows that he is not preoccupied with worldly pursuits. We get this sense as we read about John's life that he has this extraordinary dedication to God, that he has distinguished himself, that he is living in a way where he is seeking to live a holy life. More than likely, John early on was told about the remarkable circumstances concerning his birth. It would be very difficult to hide this miraculous origin story from John. We think that if Zechariah had this encounter with an angel and it was prophesied that the child that he and Elizabeth would have would, would be extraordinary and would have a unique call, John certainly knew that he had this call, but we're unsure if he knew all the details. How would all of this come to pass? When would all of it come to pass? But what we see is that John, more than likely, in this period of waiting, is cultivating a relationship with his Heavenly Father. I believe he is taking all that he knew and is being faithful to what he knew in the moment and regarding his life. Now, I want to make a point that is extremely important. We see the scripture highlights certain individuals that God uses for special purposes. Right now we're talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist has a very unique call that is specifically for him. He is the forerunner laying the groundwork for the Messiah. There will never ever be another John the Baptist. The disciples also have a special call. They are the 12 that were selected by Christ to walk with him in his earthly ministry. There will never be another group of 12 individuals that will personally walk with Christ in the flesh. The Apostle Paul is another great example that in God's plan to share the gospel into the Gentile world, Saul, later to be named Paul, was that specific instrument God would use. There would never be another Paul. But what I want to draw your attention to is that although the Bible is filled with stories of these unique individuals with special calls, there are countless others that are not even mentioned in Scripture who would go on to do powerful things for God's kingdom. These individuals will go on to live lives that right now we know nothing about. These individuals would live faithfully. They would live consecrated lives, pursuing and cultivating a powerful relationship with the Heavenly Father. If all of us have a call, maybe some of those details are not extensively known to us right now. So the question is, how should we live? What knowledge do we possess at this point in time? How would we live knowing 
what we know. We discussed the call to live a holy life, lives consecrated and set apart for God's special services. And waiting doesn't mean that we are not advancing. We indeed do continue to advance in our spiritual growth and in our understanding of who Christ is and what He has done. And this leads us to a very important thought for today. If God raised up a man like John to prepare the people for Christ's arrival before His earthly ministry, I believe we can expect God to raise up men and women before Christ's coming to again prepare the way for Him. You see, John was one man, and this call was isolated to him. But in John's day, Christ was arriving to an isolated place. And the ministry of Jesus on earth would only happen within the borders of Israel. People living outside of this region had no idea that the Son of God was active, alive, and walking upon the face of the earth. But Christ's return, or His second coming, is to be much different. If we look to Revelation chapter 1, John states these words, Look, He is coming regarding Christ with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of Him. So shall it be. Amen. You see, John is using Old Testament passages to speak about Jesus. So whether the phrase that John is using, every eye will see him, whether that's supposed to be literal or figurative, we do know for certain that Christ's return will be highly visible. Jesus' return will not be isolated to the borders of Israel. His glory, his presence, his radiance, and his power will be felt all throughout the world. I believe that it is reasonable to conclude that because the return of Christ will be felt on this global scale, God will raise up people on a global scale to herald the message, prepare for the return of the Lord. I believe as Christians, all of us need to be prepared to be that person that God will raise up to make this announcement. It doesn't matter if he wants to use us in a way where we announce this message to a few or to many. God is the one who will determine all of those details. What we need to determine in our heart is that will we act when the word of the Lord is revealed to us? And this finally brings us to point three. You see, John acted when the word of the Lord came to him. And we too must also act when the word of the Lord comes to us. So here's a quick recap for today. John had this extraordinary call upon his life. And you as a believer have a call upon your life as well. It may look much different than John the Baptist, but there in fact is a call. At this stage, the call might be incredible faithfulness in the discipleship of your own family. Or the call might be to live this set apart life in the sight of others, whether it be in the classroom or the workforce or in the retirement village. Perhaps God has laid something on your heart to do, and now is the time for it to begin. Perhaps there has been a unique call that has present, been presented to you in your past, and all of your life you've known about it. And maybe you're in a place where you're trying to run from it. There are many different situations that we as believers find ourselves in, but we know this, there is a call. And everyone, regardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in now, has a call, whether it is a general call to live holy, consecrated lives, or a technical call that has specific directions on what God is leading you to do. We also see that John waited faithfully. And in this period of waiting, he was faithfully pursuing God. Waiting does not mean being inactive. Because in the stage of waiting, we cultivate our relationship with God. 
And finally, John acted when the Lord of the Lord came to him. And if we are drawing close to the time of Christ's return, then we must be on alert. We must be faithful to Christ now more than ever. He may send word to you that will require you to act when the time is right. We are truly living in an exciting era, in an exciting day. And at times we may not feel like it because we look at the weight of responsibilities that we carry. We look at all of the things that are transpiring across the world and there is a heaviness to it. But never lose the excitement that exists from living in God's appointed time. No matter what takes place in the world, God is continuously working and He is continuously calling. Let's pray. God, we thank You that You and Your sovereignty have made way for us to live in this time, in this day, and in this age. God, we read about the special calls that you have placed on individuals' lives, and we are here today to recognize that you too have called us as believers into something great. We ask that in this time of waiting, that we would continue to grow and flourish in our relationship with you, and that when the time comes, that we will respond faithfully to your specific call. God, we sit here with anticipation of what you are doing now in our midst and what you will do in the future. God, in those moments where our hearts are heavy because of all the things that are happening around us in the world, we pray that in those moments, your spirit would stir us to examine your word and to know you more and more. We thank you for your word and for the time that we have had together today. 